All right. My name is Isidoro Lucian, and today I'm going to be talking about SCP-666. Item number, SCP-666. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-666 is to be stored in a monitored closed vault at all times at Site-73 in the Tibetan Mountains. Guards are to be changed weekly, must pass a background check before assigned to their post, and proven free of drug and alcohol addiction. SCP-666 is to be entered only by D-Class personnel in approved testing procedures, or by approved Foundation researchers with level 4 or higher security clearance. Non-D-Class personnel who enter SCP-666, whether or not they have revealed a prior history of addiction, must be observed by a guard at all times. If they show any sign of being affected by SCP-666, they are to be removed immediately. Description: SCP-666 is a medium-sized Tibetan yurt, made of tied wooden branches and covered in yak leather. The interior ceiling is 2.44 meters, or 8 feet, high, and the base of the yurt is 9.14 meters, or 30 feet. The hut is circular in shape. The interior of the yurt has a dirt floor and appears to be as crude as the outside to the majority of observers. The branches that make up the yurt frame are wrapped in rabbit leather and tied with yak leather thongs. Periodically, SCP-666 will change its location within the confinement area. This will happen only when not under direct observation. But remote. Viewing gives the impression of an entity inside the structure lifting it wholly and moving it to its new position. To date, it has not made any attempt to escape confinement. SCP-666 was discovered in 1973 by SCP operatives searching the mountain regions on reports of several missing persons having returned from the area giving similar explanations. Seeking shelter during harsh weather, the individuals would happen upon SCP-666 by seeming happenstance. Having gone out in similar conditions, the exploration team was able to discover the yurt. Of the three operatives present, two had no ill effects. The third entered a stupor, experiencing vivid hallucinations and muttering incoherently to himself. Upon retrieval of the team, the yurt was recovered and taken to nearby Site-73 for further investigation. When an individual with no history of significant addictions enters the yurt, the yurt remains dormant and seems to have no ill effects. Class D personnel without a history of alcohol or narcotics abuse were able to sit inside the yurt for days at a time if provided proper nourishments, and did report a greater intensity in their dreams. Individuals who have a history of substance abuse, however, will experience a hallucinogenic effect when inside the structure. In all instances, the subjects report being in a location either from their memories or a corollary thereof specifically a spot where their addiction was at its most intense. Thus far, there have been reports of a nightclub bathroom, a 1973 Volkswagen Vanagon, a filthy alleyway, the <laughs> casino in Las Vegas, etc. One subject reported finding himself in a dirty apartment with a prostitute named Chloe, with whom he had frequently indulged in narcotics abuse. Another reported being in his own bedroom, a computer set up significantly more intricate than he owned before his arrest for distribution of child pornography. During these hallucinations, subjects report that they are confronted by an individual, referred to as SCP-666-1. Descriptions of SCP-666-1 vary widely from person to person, with no commonality to race, gender, or appearance beyond being typical for the surroundings. SCP-666-1 will indulge the subject in their personal addictions, although at the start it will have a passive-aggressive attitude, 
As time progresses, the subject is encouraged to indulge further, while simultaneously being encouraged to stop. Should the subject show remorse or a strong desire to give up their addiction, SCP-666-1 will slowly adopt a more genuinely friendly tone and continue the temptation with discouragement hallucinations. Approximately 94% of subjects who have gone through this form of hallucination to their end have been diagnosed as having a near-complete removal of psychological addictions. Though physical symptoms will persist, through a natural withdrawal cycle. If the subject gives in to SCP-666-1's temptations, the entity becomes increasingly hostile. There is no set timetable nor degree of indulgence, but if left unchecked, SCP-666-1 will invariably begin assaulting the subject, and forcing the subject's vice upon them to levels of extreme overdose. If the subject is not forcibly removed from SCP-666 during this period, they will die. Cause of death is typical to their addiction, whereby an alcoholic will suffer extreme kidney and liver failure. A cocaine user will develop cardiac dysrhythmia. A subject addicted to video games or television will suffer extreme muscle atrophy and health issues associated with a sedentary lifestyle, etc. To date, there have been no clear connection between who will and who will not succumb to SCP-666-1. The working hypothesis is that it is simply a matter of the individual's willpower and conviction. All attempts to interview SCP-666-1 directly have failed, with the entity either redirecting the conversation or bluntly refusing to answer. The only statement that reveals anything to its nature was a single sentence. We're not important here, this is about you. This sentence indicates that there are either multiple entities attached to SCP-666, or there are additional instances of SCP-666 in the world. Investigation is ongoing as to whether similar stories have arisen. Should another instance of SCP-666 be discovered, it is to be transferred immediately to Site-73. Addendum SCP-666-1 Nearly identical stories have recently arisen in remote areas of northern Canada, describing a Wendigo hut. While unconfirmed, their similarities point to at least one additional instance of SCP-666 at large. Addendum SCP-666-2 Interview Log with Test Subject D-14390 Regarding Experiences in SCP-666 Interviewer Dr. Lanos Interview Subject, D-14390 Date, April 17th, 19... Subject, D-14390 How are you feeling? Eh, not bad, Doc, not bad. Kinda wanna take another nap in that tent. Well, that's what we're here to talk about. Please describe your experience inside SCP-666. <laughs> no sweat there, Doc. See, I just stroll in like you said, have myself a seat. Next thing I know, I'm in this sweet hole in the wall back home and... With this sweet bitch, Chloe. Chloe? Oh yeah. She was pricey. And she wasn't the best looking trick south of Kennedy. But she had some connections. Never did meet up with her once that we weren't getting high. Notes. Chloe was the working name of a prostitute that D-14390 was with at the time of his arrest. Very well. Please describe the scenario for me. Well, it was her apartment, right? Kinda dingy, a little messy, like she hadn't cleaned it for a couple weeks. But I wasn't there for the scenery, you know? So I drop my cash off at the living room table and we head to the bedroom. I shoot up with her, use my own needle of course, and then we get freaky. I mean, 
We did everything under the sun. And a couple that had never seen the light of day. She knew positions I never did. And had drugs I hadn't even heard of. About halfway through, I needed to pick me up. So I snorted a couple lines of Colombian off her ass and I think that's enough, D-14390. For the sake of brevity, please keep the rest of your testimony in regards to the anomalous entity SCP-666-1. The what now? The... person who tempted you into your hallucination. Oh, right. Well, it was around this time that she was offering me this opium shit that she'd got off a Chinaman. Old time, she'd been saying stuff in a kind of funny way. Like those, uh, whatchamacallit, backface comments. Backhanded compliment? That's the stuff. Well, I start taking a couple of pulls off the opium, and I'm feeling mellow. But she's just glaring at me, right? So I ask what's up, and she hauls off and punches me in the face. Not like this fragile little crack whore would, either. I mean, I thought I was going 10 with Tyson right about now. She starts screaming at me, calling me weak, saying I'm pathetic, just giving in, you know, bitch shit. So I kick her in the chest, and that's when shit got weird. Next I know, she's got me on the ground, and her arms are around my throat. Her eyes get huge and bloodshot and shit. I can feel her nails digging to the side of my neck. And hand to God, Doc, she was shooting shit into me. You're saying SCP-666-1 was injecting you with heroin through her nails. Not sure what it was, but it burned and felt good at the same time. And they weren't nails no more, it was like big cat claws, right? And she's still yelling at me, but her mouth is getting bigger and bigger, like her jaws stretching out, and her teeth keep getting sharper and bigger, like she's about ready to eat my head. Even as blasted as I was, that was some freaky shit. And I started screaming. And that was when the guards pulled you out of the tent? Yeah. Seems I wasn't just freaking out in the dream. Weird shit was. About like... Five seconds after I get pulled out, I hear Chloe's voice again. But it's all low and growly. And it sounded like she said, You can't stop. Thank you, D-14390. I just have one last question. After all this, you said you wanted to go back in. Why? Well, <laughs> it's simple, right? She was scary and all, but man, I've never been that high in my entire life. And with the shit that goes on in this place, I figured I'm not long for this world anyway. So I might as well go out with a smile. Right? Notes Following the interview, D-14390 repeatedly volunteered for additional testing with SCP-666. Dr. Lannis finally relented. D-14390 began screaming approximately three seconds after entering the hallucinatory state and expired from cardiac arrest less than one minute later. Alright, that's all I have to say about this subject.